Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it's uh, difficult times uh, these days, and um, you know it is 1:35 uh, a.m. in my time zone, which is New York, and that's why I'm speaking a little softer so I don't wake up my neighbors. Um, and I'm a developer advocate for Google Google Cloud, and I love to bring some of the latest and greatest technology that we have uh, to Java developers, especially to Spring Boot developers. And uh, I myself and other engineers have worked with Pivotal. Uh, in the past with the uh, Spring engineers to uh, create this project called Spring Cloud GCP and uh, we'll have to show you some of the new things that we have in the store. So if you have any questions, you can find me on Twitter, which is Satanism, uh, or you can find a lot of the content, materials, uh, workshops on my website, which is satanism.me. So about two years ago, uh, I started off with a proof of a concept to make Google Cloud really, really easy to use with Spring Boot. And uh, the, the proof of concept focus on just uh, making uh, our database uh, called Spanner really easy to use. Uh, and then it grow into this uh, awesome project called Spring Cloud GCP, which has a number of really idiomatic, uh, easy to use uh, Spring Boot starters that can help you to create your new services or migrate existing services and adopt GCP services very, very easily. And the engineering team here at Google uh, really work together with the Spring engineers as well to make sure that the integration is idiomatic and it's something that's really useful for you as well. Um, and we have today about, oh, I don't know, like about 14 integrations uh, spanning across all of the different cross-cutting concerns from configuration with our secret manager to store your secrets, uh, credentials and configuration, to messaging with pops up, to multiple database options here, uh, including a reactive data store and R2 DBC driver, uh, and also Hibernate if you want to use that. Uh, there's just a lot of these um, integrations that we just made uh, for Spring Boot developers to use uh, so that you can write applications the way that you are accustomed to while being able to leverage many of these capabilities. Uh, for the operation perspective, we have uh, starters for you to hook into Stackdriver Trace, to get centralized logging, to get metrics into your monitoring, uh, and uh, also security as well. So I'm gonna try to uh, go through some of these things with only demos. So uh, it is 1.35 a.m. in the morning. Uh, I hope um, you're awake, I'm awake, and uh, we can get through this in about 30 minutes or so. I'm not gonna show everything here, but uh, hopefully uh, just enough uh, for you to get a good sense of what we're dealing with, okay? So of course, uh, I'm gonna start off with the Spring Initializer. Uh, and here you can pick and choose the capabilities that you want. The really, really important part of it is that uh, we do have GCP support that you can pick and choose. Uh, we do have a few other ones, even though we have about 14 different integrations, uh, we can only show three here. So uh, just remember there's more than what you see in the dropdown, but the easiest way for you to get started is to generate a new application with GCP support. Uh, for this demo, what I'm going to use is uh, Maven because uh, that's the only build tool I know how to use. And um, I'm gonna use Kotlin uh, just because it's, a, it's gonna be a little faster for me to type and it's, uh, concise and it's a great language uh, for Java developers to learn. And um, here we go. So I actually bootstrapped my application already. Uh, this is uh, all just generated directly from that initializer just a few minutes ago. Uh, as you can see, this is using automatically importing the Spring Cloud version here with Hoxton. Uh, that's the version that works with Spring Boot 2.2. And uh, the Spring Cloud GCP project here is actually part of the release train. So if you're using uh, Hoxton release or a Greenwich release, uh, you can actually use Spring Cloud GCP services and adapters immediately. Okay. And uh, what we're going to do is to just uh, write a simple app that will be able to use you know, our database behind the scenes, something uh, that's really amazing, uh, that goes beyond a regular uh, SQL database. And then we're going to add capabilities with messaging. We're going to add trace. We're going to have centralized logging. And uh, if we're lucky, we will have time to also deploy this into our environment and maybe even a little bit more. Um, we'll see if we can get this done in about 30 minutes or so. Okay, so in this app, uh, I actually already uh, just added a few lines of code here, right? Usually when we start a Spring Boot application, we wanna talk with the database, uh, you will create a POJO that will be used for ORM or the object relational mapping. And uh, because I'm using Kotlin here, I'm creating a data class. Now, 
Of course, we can use the regular SQL databases like MySQL, Cloud, um, PostgreSQL, or even MS SQL on Google Cloud. Uh, it's really simple and straightforward to create one of the instances, right? We can actually go here to the console and create a new SQL instance. And if you want to create a new instance, uh, you can just pick and choose the type of database that you want to create. And then we can automatically configure highly available uh, configurations for you with a master and worker uh, failovers across multiple zones or region, okay? But today uh, on Google Cloud, we also have a number of other choices. For example, we have no SQL databases that you can use uh, that's fully managed so that you don't actually have to manage anything yourself. And for that, it's called Firestore uh, and it's Data Store. So these are document-oriented database. Uh, and sometimes the, your data is still relational uh, and just to use a NoSQL data store for scalability is not the best option because you do have relational data. In that case, you still want to use a relational database, but wouldn't it be nice to have a relational database that is horizontally scalable as you need to okay, and strongly consistent and relational? Uh, and those three things don't usually work together and that's why we have ideas of NoSQL, right? There's the cap theorem and stuff like that. Uh, usually you only get two capabilities out of the three. But on Google Cloud, we have another database here called Cloud Spanner. And this is a really amazing database which you can just create a new instance and that can span across the globe if you want to, uh, across three continents, and it will still be strongly consistent and you can still scale them out horizontally. Okay, so if you ever need new capacity, you can just add another node. So today, rather than showing, you know, the, the regular SQL database stuff, I'm just gonna show you how to do this very easily in this fully managed database called Cloud Spanner. So the first thing I'm going to do is to create a, a new instance. So I'm gonna call that uh, instance demo, for example, it's my demo instance. And here I can pick and choose uh, the, um, the availability that I want. I can have it within a single region that will be you know, spread across multiple availability zones, or I can create an instance that's spread across multiple regions. And so for example, I can use uh, this North America, Europe, and Asia region, right? So we have a globally distributed database, or I can pick one that's specifically only within North America, for example. And I can pick and choose the number of nodes that I want. And uh, with this type of configuration, we can get 99.999% availability. Uh, which is amazing for something that you can just create in a few seconds. And that is it. We just created a new Spanner database and uh, we can go ahead and create a new schema uh, in my code. Let me see here. I have a person uh, object here. We have the ID and the name. Now for Spanner, uh, what we really want to do is to avoid any auto increment IDs because it is horizontally scalable. So we will shard the data for you. We will organize the data for you behind the scenes. But if the ID is strictly increasing and incrementing, uh, then it will be really difficult to shard this data. And for that reason, uh, we want to use something that's more random like UUID, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and create a new table here just called person. And um, I'm gonna add a new ID here but rather than using a number, I'm going to use a string to store UUID. And that's typically about 36 uh, characters long. I'm gonna set it to not null. And I'm gonna set a name here to string as well, because I do have a field called name. And um, I'm gonna continue. And I can add the ID as to my primary key. Now, of course, uh, if you don't wanna go through this via the UI, you can always use the DDL so you can document your table creations, and you can run this through a script as you provision your database, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and create this. So I just created a brand new multi-regional database that's strongly consistent and relational in a few seconds, and now it's ready to be used. That's pretty, pretty cool. So what do I do here in my code with the Spring Cloud GCP uh, integration is that first, I can go ahead and add the Spanner starter. So everything that we have, we created really easy to adapt uh, starters. So here we have uh, the Spring, uh, Spring Data uh, Adapter for Spinner. And remember we have the same thing for Data Store and Firestore. And uh, this is just as this, you use the same way, okay? So for the POJO, I'm going to go ahead and annotate this with table, okay? So rather than using the GPA entity, I'm just gonna use table. For the ID, I will mark it as a primary key. And that is really it. 
And for the repository, I can continue to use the paging and sorting repository that everyone's familiar with, but I can also just, you know, annotate this with the repository, or we went so far to also integrate with the repository REST resource so that we can expose this uh, directly as the RESTful interface using Spring Data REST. And we also integrated with all the finder methods so we can, for example, uh, infer the find methods for you automatically, or you can also annotate the method with a query method as well. And many other things within Spring Data like auditing and uh, sending out events. Uh, if somebody inserted a new piece of information using Spanner uh, through this repository, you can receive the event and uh, you can act accordingly as well. Okay. And uh, just like that, we will be able to access my Spanner database with CROWD operation. Now, just to make things a little bit more interesting, I'm going to go ahead and just create a little REST controller here uh, with this hello controller. I'm going to get a configuration here for greeting so that in the end, I can just return a greeting message, right? So if you say hello to this endpoint, I'm gonna say hello back, okay? And um, I'm going to just go ahead in this current case, I'm going to go ahead and, oh, uh -oh. Ooh, 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 ooh. what happened to my keyboard? Oh, I know what happened, caps lock. That's a dangerous thing to have in a live demo. Uh, and uh, especially with the VI binding, with the cap lock, uh, you don't know what the ID is doing anymore. Okay, IntelliJ, you're drunk. All right, anyways, from here on, what I'm going to do is go ahead and uh, automatically uh, inject my person repository, okay? Uh, and then I can just use the repository to save a new person. So I'm gonna say person repository uh, dot save, and I can go ahead and create person. Now, because I'm using uh, Kotlin, I can use this really nice um, constructor parameters, so or uh, uh, function parameters here. So I can say id is equal to uid dot random uid dot two string, uh, and the name is the name that I received, and that's pretty much it. So right now I have a hello endpoint that can receive a name, and I can save it to my Spanner database, but also using the REST interface as well. So uh, let me go ahead and give it a try, but before I do it, I also need to make sure that I have configured my Springful application to point to this newly created Spinner instance. So from the application.properties, I can go ahead and find my configuration. As you can see, we have all the properties uh, auto-populated here in IntelliJ with auto-completion. Uh, that is super useful uh, for me as well because uh, I cannot possibly remember all the possible things that we can configure here. Uh, there's a lot. Uh, but the auto completion is really awesome. So I can just go ahead and create, uh, configure my instance and my database, which I just created. And let's go ahead and run this. Now, as this is going to start, uh, one thing I'm going to note is that it will automatically discover the credentials that's currently on my machine, okay? So what that means is that when this application starts, it will automatically discover the credential that I can actually use to connect to uh, Google Cloud, and in this case, to Spanner. And this credential is actually stored uh, using the command line here called gcloud. This is the CLI, the command line interface that allows you to access all of Google Cloud uh, just from the command. And um, there's a little command here you can do, which is alt, and you can do application default logging. And what this will do is to use OAuth2 to authenticate you, and then it will pull down the credential and store that in a well-known location in your home directory, okay? And when the application starts, it's going to discover this credential automatically, and then it will use that credential to connect. But that's only for development purposes. If you're running in a Google Cloud environment, uh, typically you are able to discover the credential from a metadata server so that you can get this credential uh, directly from the runtime environment. But if you want to be super safe, you can also create a service account, which is a, pri a private key, uh, that's embedded in a JSON file, and you can use that service account as a credential and can configure the application to use that instead. Okay, so if you're running on premise, you can use the service account. If you're running in Google Cloud environment, we can use auto discovery. And if you're running locally, use gcloud to authenticate and everything will be connected. So let's go ahead and give this application a try. I'm going to go ahead and create a new file here called test.http. This is a really easy and simple way in IntelliJ for me to uh, send out a web request. 
So uh, hopefully this works. I'm going to say hello. Name is, uh, I see Josh is online. So I'm going to say hello, Josh, and uh, run this. And hopefully, ooh, what is that? Uh, table not found. Oh, <laughs> I think I must have uh, misconfigured my uh, instance a little bit. Yeah, of course. The, I made a mistake here. My instance name is called demo, but my database name is called person, and my table name is also called person. So let me go ahead and fix this. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and fix this. My database name is called person. Uh, that's a really bad mistake because uh, my database name is the same as the table name. Uh, who does that? Um, so hopefully um, we can get this up and running in a second. Um, I do want to say hi to Josh uh, since he's here also. And I see a lot of uh, many other familiar faces too. So I'm going to say hi to everyone uh, in a second. Okay, so let me try this again. I'm going to say test HTTP. Say hello to Josh and Oh, this one actually works. And we say hello back, right? That's pretty straightforward. Uh, and I can also see this data uh, directly from the uh, REST repository too. So if I go to the root, I should be able to see that I have the person's REST repository. If I go to persons, then I will be able to see that this piece of information is actually there. And of course, if I want to, uh, I can also dig in into this sub URL that's unique to this, uh, to this uh, record, okay? But of course, you might be saying, wait a second, what if that's just embedded? Well, in an embedded database, that's just in memory. It is not, it's actually in the Spanner database. If I go back to my newly created instance here, if I go to data, uh, I should be able to see this information right here. But now you might be saying, wait a second, that could be there this whole time. So this still can be fake. So what I'm gonna say is, um, I think Adrian Co is online. So I'm gonna say, hello, Adrian. And um, store, say hello, store this piece of information, come back here, and uh, I need to do a little refresh. I'm just gonna do that and go to data. And there he is. So that's pretty cool. Um, if you are going to uh, write a microservice that requires asynchronous operation, uh, sometimes you may want to offload the processing of the data to another process, then maybe you want to consider using a messaging queue, right? And I've been in consulting and in the Java space for 15 years. And uh, I'm also uh, in a previous company, I also had to set up uh, a highly available messaging system. And that is not fun. It can be very difficult to do, especially if you're on premise. In the cloud, what we can do is to simply create a messaging uh, topic uh, with a few clicks and without any backend infrastructure that you have to maintain, you get a globally available, highly available messaging system that you can send information and receive uh, the data from the message queue. So let's see how this works. So what I'm going to do is to create a topic that, will, that we will send the person's name to as soon as somebody says hello. And then uh, we're going to create a little subscriber that will quickly receive this information and then you can do uh, the processing that you need to. So to do that, what we're going to do is use something called PubSub, okay? And uh, PubSub just stands for Publish and Subscribe. And a PubSub system on Google Cloud is um, global by nature. It's uh, serverless in the way that you don't actually have to maintain any backend infrastructure. It is highly available out of the box. So I'm going to create a new topic here called people, which I'm going to send the names to. And that is it. In a half a second, I have a new uh, messaging system ready to go. And now I can go ahead and create a subscription. So here I can call this people subscription. So I can subscribe, subscribe to, and I'm gonna create that too. We can do uh, one too many, and um, we can um, you know, publish the message to multiple subscriptions if you, if you want to, okay? And uh, just like that, we have the PopSub configured. And if I wanna use PopSub here, uh, I can just go ahead and use a starter, of course. I'm gonna add the PopSub starter. This actually integrates with Spring integration, Spring Cloud Stream, and Spr Spring Cloud Bus, okay? So just by adding this starter, if you have any of those things, you can use Spring integration and or Spring Cloud Stream with PopSub. Very cool. However, if you don't want to use Spring, uh, uh, Spring integration or any of those things, if you just want to do this very quickly with uh, a template, uh, we have that too. So just by adding this uh, starter, 
then we can get access to the PubSub template and we can get access to the PubSub uh, publisher uh, template, I think that's the name. Yep, there it is. Uh, so I'm gonna just call this the publisher template. That's a, a little bit too long of a name. So I'm gonna say publisher template is the PubSub uh, publisher template, okay? And hopefully this will allow me to import this, yep. And then what I can do is to just go ahead and use the PubSub publisher template. I can publish my message like that. I'm gonna publish it into the people topic and I'm gonna publish the name uh, that I just received, okay? And that's it. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and restart this application right now and uh, stop and run. Uh, in the meantime, what I'm going to do is to just go ahead and create a new project. Uh, now I'm gonna do this now in IntelliJ because in IntelliJ we also have a way to create a new service using the Spring Initializer. And um, you can create a new subscriber. Uh, for example, I'm gonna call it subscriber. And it's using the initializer, so you can pick and choose. Again, you can use Reactive, for example. And here you can use GCP messaging and just add that. And this will generate a project for you. Uh, to save some time, I have the project generated here, <coughs> where, again, we have the pom.xml. And in this case, we have pops up added to my dependencies automatically. Uh, and in this application, what I can do is just use the application runner to uh, create a, a command line application that would you start. Um, and we have two different options here. We can actually use the PubSub template, uh, which is the subscriber template to receive this message. Or if you like the reactive stuff, we can also use PubSub reactive factory. Uh, this is new uh, and uh, we are integrating pretty well in the reactive world with the reactive um, uh, data store uh, integrations and also R2DBC. And for pops up, we have Spring Cloud Stream, but also this Reactive Factory. And what this allows you to do is to say, Reactive Factory, let me pull the people subscri subscription um, in very, uh, maybe uh, 100 milliseconds. Uh, and then I can go ahead and subscribe, and this will give me the message. Okay. And once I receive the message, of course, I can do everything that's intermediate as well. Like I can do filter if I want to. Um, and anything else that's in the flux. This actually creates a flux, okay? And I'm going to go ahead and acknowledge the message so that I can acknowledge that I have processed it. I'm going to go ahead and print this out. So I'm gonna say print line message dot get pop some message, get data dot to string, okay? And that is pretty much it. That's all it takes to write a little subscriber, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and start both of these applications to just make sure everything works. Uh, by the way, this one, I'm, I'm going to run this on a random port. And uh, this will start, and it should be listening for messages now. Uh, again, the authentication is done automatically behind the scenes using the gcloud credentials. And here we go. So let's see if this works. I'm going to go ahead and run this uh, here. I'm going to open up the HTTP. Um, let's see, who else is here? I think uh, Tommy is here, and Tasha is here too, right? Tasha is here, so I'm going to say hello to Tasha. And I'm going to run this. And I'm going to save the message into Spanner, but also I'm going to publish the message. And hopefully when I come back to this view, oh, I got a little error here, but uh, oh, they didn't see it, yeah. So uh, there was some uh, connection issue here with my internet, but that's okay. But uh, this is definitely trying to uh, pull this message right now. Uh, and uh, if, uh, yeah, maybe I'll try this out later, but this should be continuing to pull. If uh, the connection here recovers, uh, that should be okay as well, okay? Um, now, if you're writing a microservice, uh, usually you will have asynchronous uh, processing uh, that you can use with pops up, but uh, more likely you also have these synchronous calls. So for example, you may have one, call, uh, one service calling another via a REST interface. And when you have microservices, what you also want is the observability. So you want to be able to see uh, who's making the call. So you need something like distributed tracing. And uh, in Spring, of course, there's Spring Cloud Sleuth, and uh, it can automatically instrument and trace the application for you. And what we have done is to just hook into that. And uh, all you need to do to add trace and then uh, propagating this trace to our services is by running uh, by adding the trace starter. 
Uh, what this will do is to pull in Spring Cloud Sleuth, but then we'll also automatically configure the sender so that all the trace information can be sent to StackDriver Trace or Cloud Trace now. Okay, so what that also means is that uh, you can use the same facility that you're accustomed to, uh, but then you don't have to run and host your own trace server uh, yourself. And uh, we have a hosted uh, managed service for you to do just that. Uh, so oh, you can see all the traces uh, in our console too. Now, what you have also noticed is here is that I have a logging, right? So I can actually see the logs here. Um, and the logs, I also want to store them somewhere, right? So uh, if you're running in Google Cloud's Kubernetes engine, then we will automatically ingest these logs for you as soon as you put it into STD out. But since I'm doing this demo on my own machine, imagine if you're on-premise, uh, then what you need to do is to add our logging starter instead. Uh, and then you can configure logback to send the log messages to, uh, to us as well. So I'm going to create a logback configuration here. And uh, it's going to be API, con uh, not that one. Let me see here, log, API, and console. Okay. So what we give you is some pre-configured uh, appenders that you can add. And you can then configure your logback to use these appenders. Okay. So for example, for this thing, I'm going to use the console appender. And I'm also going to send it to StackDriver as well. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, restart this app. Again, <clears throat> oh, and before I do that, let me uh, also simulate the, the microservice code a little bit. Um, so what I'm going to do is to basically, oh, let me see here at the time. Yeah, got 10 minutes, good. So what I'm going to do is to basically um, um, make, uh, uh, use a REST template um, and make another endpoint that will use the REST template to call my own application a couple of times, okay? So let me just do that right now. So here we have the demo application. I'm going to go ahead and create the REST template bin. And let me just go ahead and import both of these. Okay. And then I'm going to automatically inject the REST template here. Private val REST template. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is to make a little O um, endpoint. So slash O, this is going to uh, iterate across a few names here, uh, myself, uh, Mandy, who I work with as I first joined Google Cloud, and uh, Jisha, who also worked on this project in the past. Uh, they're both really, really awesome. So I'm going to iterate through these names. I'm going to make the call uh, to myself with the name, right? So I'm going to call myself a couple of times. Uh, in the meantime, I'm also going to say a log.info. Let me see here, uh, log. logger.info, for example. Uh, before O, and then uh, I'm going to say after O, okay? Just to see what this looks like. And I'm going to go ahead and restart, and uh, hopefully all of these things uh, are still connected properly so that um, we can get to see the trace and the log all showing up in a single console, okay? Let's see here. So we started the application. Everything started fine. Right? We're still uh, authenticated. We're still connecting. And uh, let me go ahead and go to the test HTTP. And rather than hitting the person's endpoint, uh, I'm just gonna hit the O endpoint, okay? <clears throat> and remember, this is gonna say hello a couple of times and uh, it's done. But if I come back here to the application, I can see now we have the trace ID in my log message. We have the span ID. And also luckily, uh, this particular request was actually sampled. So that is what this uh, last uh, field is. Now, the sampling is not guaranteed because uh, currently by default, the sampling rate is about uh, 10%. So if you wanna up this to 100%, you can too, and you can just configure Spring Cloud Sleuth probability, uh, and we will honor all of these because behind the scenes, it's really just auto configuring the sender, okay? So now what does this mean? Uh, hopefully what this means is that all the traces are propagated to our system. So in Google Cloud Console, we have the trace view. And here we should be able to go to the trace list. Now I'm really nervous because I haven't tested this earlier. <laughs> and here we have, ah, here we have two endpoints. And we can see clearly we have slash all. Okay, very good. Uh, and then we can see these calls. So we can see the call from all to Ray, to Mandy, and to Jisha. 
Now you can also see that we have these async codes behind the scenes too. Uh, that's because Spring Cloud Sleuth is automatically instrumenting the stuff that's happening in the executor service as well. Uh, you can of course turn that off if you want to, but here's the magical point. Uh, here's the magic, because we're also propagating the log to our centralized logger. And we're putting the trace ID and the span ID in the right place. So what we can also do is to just click on show log. And what this will do is to, within the context of the trace, we can see these log messages or arrows as they occur within the context of the trace, right? So we can see all the log messages align in the right places. It's super, super awesome. And then we can also open the log message viewer to see a particular log message in detail. Uh, and if you actually happens to have some exceptions that you have never seen before, we will automatically detect these exceptions and we will tell you what these errors are. We will give you an histogram on how often these exceptions are happening. And you can click into this and you can do further analysis just by having your error logs uh, directly stored in our centralized logger. Uh, this is super useful uh, because who wakes up on a Friday morning and asks, hmm, I wonder what new exceptions I have. Well, you can check this console uh, or we can even email you and, uh, and now you can discover new issues before your users or customers experience them at mass, okay? So let me go back to the slide a little bit. There's a lot of things that we went through. And for Spanner, just remember, we also have Hibernate adapters that can work with Spring Data JPA, but we also have R2BBC adapter as well. So if you ever wanna try Cloud Spanner with your reactive application, you can use the R2DBC driver. Um, one thing I did not get to show um, just because of the time is the Spring Cloud config with Secret Manager, okay? So actually, you know what? We do have about five minutes left, I believe. So I'm gonna just go ahead and show what this looks like. So let me go ahead and go to Secret. Uh, this is under Security, Security. <clears throat> and this is brand new, by the way. Uh, Secret Manager just came out, uh, GA, just very, very recently. And I can go ahead and create a secret. And I do have a variable that I'm using my app called greetings. I'm gonna just go ahead and use that. And I'm gonna use, um, I'm gonna change the greeting to hola instead of hello. I'm going to create this secret, okay? Now, if I go back to my app, um, you get the drill. Uh, all we have to do is to add this configuration, secret manager uh, for the starter. And then, because this is actually pulling in Spring Cloud config behind the scenes, so what we do need to add is a bootstrap.properties. So we're gonna add bootstrap.properties. Uh, and then we need to turn Secret Manager on because it is not on by default. So I'm gonna turn it on. And this is actually uh, under bootstrap.enabled is equal to true. And just like that, that's all it takes for your application to be able to get that property in, uh, and we're referencing it here using uh, SPL for greeting. And as soon as I restart my app, we should be connected to Secret Manager, pulling down that piece of information. And uh, when I say hello again, uh, hopefully I will see hola instead of hello. So I'm gonna give that really a try. I should really just leave it, to be honest, but uh, I have to go for it, right? I have to, I have to show it, I have to prove that it works. And luckily, it does right here. So you can see how easy it was to integrate this entire system with the, our services. And now you can also store your credentials in Secret Manager, okay? Um, remember for Pops Up, we have Spring integration support and uh, you can create something um, that takes inbound messages and pushing it into our data warehouse and uh, for long-term storage very, very easily. We got Spring Cloud Stream and Spring Cloud Bus and reactive support for, for Pops Up. For Sleuth, we have Cloud Trace, and you get decentralized logging. And uh, one thing that's really cool is that for Micrometer, uh, Micrometer also has that driver uh, support as well, so that you can actually push your metrics, your application metrics, directly into our monitoring system and uh, using Micrometer uh, pretty easily as well. And I think Tommy is also online, and uh, he's been helping me out quite a bit there. And this is the whole view of everything that we actually have. Now, within the last three minutes, uh, what I'm going to do is to quickly, just uh, quickly um, uh, deploy this. Assuming I have time, I want to make sure I'm mindful of the time. Yeah, I think so. I got uh, about, just about three minutes left. 
Okay, so what am I gonna do is to create a container from here. Now I know in Spring Boot 2.3, you can create a container directly using the Spring Boot uh, plugin. Uh, however, I'm using 2.2, so to create this uh, container, I'm gonna use Jib. So this is just a plugin that's created by Google, and we can create a container uh, very easily, even without Docker running on your machine, and you do not need to write the Docker file either. And with Jib, what I can do is I can go ahead and do a compile, I'm going to do a jib build. And what this will do is to analyze your build file will automatically create the best image uh, with the best practices uh, for this particular application. We will layer this uh, in the proper way and we'll push this directly to the remote registry without you having to even have Docker running locally, okay? And uh, this is pushing out the, uh, my app uh, via my very slow home network. Uh, and once this is done, uh, what I can do is to deploy into our serverless environment. We have something called App Engine with platforms as a service, which we can just do gcloud app deploy, um, the target and the jar. That's one way to deploy this into App Engine. But if you wanna use containers, we have another thing called cloud run. So I can say gcloud run deploy uh, spring live and the image name is the one I just created. And uh, I can say the CPU count is two and memory that I want is two gigabyte, two GI, right? Hopefully, uh, oh, sorry, uh, unrecognized argument. So maybe two and two. So let's see if this works. I can say publish it to Cloud Run fully manage. And I wanna deploy this into US Central One region. I want to be able to let everyone here to be able to access it. And what this will do is to spin up your container in a completely serverless environment. Uh, and then uh, we'll set up the load balancing for you, the HTTPS um, certificates as well for this shared environment. Uh, and uh, very quickly, our containers will be spun up directly on the Google infrastructure with the right sandboxing around your app. Uh, and, uh, and we should be able to, oh, no, huh, I need to listen on the port, <clears throat> but we should be able to, um, to see your app uh, up and running uh, fairly easily. So unfortunately, uh, this did not go, but uh, my time is up. That's why I keep this uh, to the very last minute. And uh, I believe uh, we are going to have maybe some question, time for questions. So thank you so much for your time. If you wanna check this out, you can try all the collabs and everything I shall show in our collabs uh, URL. Uh, Josh also had happened to write, had written a eight part series on how to use all of these things. And uh, we also have many recorded videos and content around this as well. So thank you so much for your time and um, thanks for having me here.